Canada will be welcoming an additional 50,000 immigrants over the next two years. However, if any one of these people has a disability, the welcome mat will be pulled out quickly from under their feet, or wheels. Hello and welcome to another edition of DNET, the Disability Network. I'm Joe Coglin, And I'm Susan Pettit. Today we'll hear how families can be torn apart by the way Canada's immigration policy treats people with disabilities. And we'll meet Jack Austin, who was barred from jury duty because he's deaf. We'll also meet a mechanic who is blind. Nick Pantaluck will tell us the secret of his success. But first, here's this week's roundup of disability stories from across the country. Secretary of State Jerry Weiner responded this week to a report of the Standing Committee on the Status of Disabled Persons. The report released last June called for action on the economic integration of disabled persons into Canadian society. In the House, the Secretary of State called for several initiatives. A comprehensive review of federal laws and regulations to ensure that they offer equal access, participation and opportunities for persons with disabilities. The government will proceed with a post-census survey to improve a national database on persons with disabilities. A committee of deputy ministers, chaired by the Under Secretary of State, to facilitate more effective coordination of federal initiatives. The government response calls for access, integration and participation. While the measures are a step forward, they fall short of creating job opportunities and access. By tabling his response, Weiner has postponed action which will directly improve the economic security of disabled persons. Weiner says the initiative is a first step. What we have before us, as I said, are the first responses of the government. They're all positive. Now we have an opportunity to consult very actively with the, uh, with the community and uh, uh, sometime in the next year uh, or, or as soon as we can uh, finalize the suggestions that will be brought forward, we'll have initiative uh, to actually implement program. The reaction from the opposition came quickly. Neil Young, an original member of the Committee of the Status of Disabled Persons, condemned the report as too little, too late. Does the minister responsible for disabled Canadians really care about their full participation in community affairs? Mr. Speaker, talk is cheap, and that's what we've seen in today's report on disability. Talk, talk, and more talk, and cheap, cheap, and more cheap. TransHelp, the transit service for disabled riders in Peel Region, west of Toronto, has run out of money. As a result, the service has been cut back by 20%. Authorities say there will be no relief until the new year. People who use the service say they can't get to work, to school, or to medical appointments. Lee Middleton, a spokesperson for a group of protesters, says the level of service is much worse than officials are admitting. They have been telling me that they have run out of resources, that their budget won't allow for any more rides, no subscription, new subscription passes till the beginning of the year, and that no subscription pass rides had been refused were all. Probably they have. A leading consumer advocate says Canadian banks are stretching the definition of disability to comply with federal requirements. According to David Baker of the Advocacy Resource Centre for the Handicapped, people who wear glasses and have minor speech impediments are being counted as disabled. Joanne De Laurentiis of the Canadian Bankers Association has denied Baker's charge. She says banks had underreported the number of disabled on staff in the past. She says the new numbers reflect the true proportion of disabled staff. In 1989, banks reported a doubling of disabled staff to 4.2% of the total workforce. The British Columbia Premier's Advisory Council for Persons with Disabilities recently unveiled its five-year plan. As expected, the plan focused on critical areas such as transportation, employment and housing. Among the recommendations, fuel tax rebates for disabled persons who own their own vehicles but are unable to drive, province-wide accessibility of taxis and BC Transit vehicles, provincial housing policies which meet the needs of disabled people and equitable employment representation in civil service and crown corporations. The council plans to review and assess present programs and policies. 
to determine how effectively they are meeting the needs of disabled persons. A tribunal of the Canadian Human Rights Commission has been told that the chief federal electoral officer should ensure that all disabled persons have access to polling stations. The Commission is examining complaints made in Manitoba after the 1984 federal election. Six years ago, Lucy DeLuca was enumerated for the federal election. She was told to vote at this church. The problem was the flight of stairs to the basement. It was impossible for her to get down in a wheelchair. Well, there were three, four of us in wheelchairs from my block that uh, went down to the advance pole. And when we got there, we discovered there were four stairs. We had to be carried in and out. The man leading the fight says the six years of delays leading to the hearings makes him wonder if Elections Canada really cares. It's a very frustrating um, concern to us that uh, leads us to believe that Elections Canada really is more concerned in the minute technical details rather than actually providing an election that, uh, uh, or, or a guarantee rather, of a fair election to our members. Representatives of disability organizations say they were shocked by the news that the federal government has set up an elite private medical clinic. The facility is restricted to politicians, top bureaucrats and the military brass. Patients are drawn from a unique list of 1,200 who are eligible to use the service. Immediately after this news roundup, Greg Pick of the Canadian Paraplegic Association will give his personal opinion. Each year, hundreds of diabetics lose their sight to a condition which could be effectively treated if detected early. Jerry Barrer has this report from Montreal. Danielle Malot has had diabetes since she was eight and recently developed abnormalities of the blood vessels of her eye. People with diabetes are very susceptible to this problem, a condition called diabetic retinopathy, which can lead to blindness. It's easier, much easier to treat this problem if we manage to catch it at an early stage. Malo undergoes laser therapy, a quick treatment that shrinks the blood vessels. Because diabetics can have the condition without knowing it, it's important for them to have eye checkups regularly. Jerry Bearer, CBC News, Montreal. The House of Commons has developed a job training program for developmentally handicapped high school students in Ottawa. Since 1986, the House has worked with two high schools to develop a practical work experience program for the students. The students are given part-time jobs in government offices. Government workers volunteer their time to help train the young people, acting as job coaches or buddies. Bruce Halliday, who chairs a parliamentary committee on disability, says the purpose of the project is to train mentally disabled students in skills and behaviors that increase their future job prospects. The program is run out of the office of the common speaker, John Fraser. And that's this week's roundup of Disability News. And now, here with a personal comment on the Elite Medical Clinic in Ottawa is Greg Pick, National Public Affairs Coordinator of the Canadian Paraplegic Association. Recent revelations that Ottawa senior officials, senators and members of parliament are receiving extraordinary medical treatment is cause for deep concern in Canada. In a health system which is rapidly falling apart and begs for reform, we can ill afford a medical system which provides any special treatment based solely on one's status. Furthermore, we cannot break away from the concept of universality and create medical centers which cater to two groups, those who can afford treatment and those who cannot afford treatment. If any one group was to be shunted aside under such a model, it would be disabled persons. Statistics indicate that poverty among disabled persons is running rampant, and surely this group, who can ill afford a two-tier medical system, requires in general the constant medical scrutiny and top treatment from our medical profession. You cannot endorse a medical practice whose entrance sign states, only the elite need apply. For the Disability Network, I'm Greg Pick. Greg Pick is with the Canadian Paraplegic Association. We'll be right back. Canada recently upped its immigration quota by 50,000. People with disabilities, however, cannot expect to feel any more welcome than they've been in the past. 
Section 19 of the Immigration Act states that if a person with a disability imposes an excessive demand on the health and social system, they can be refused admission to Canada. Shanawaz Jaffer, who has Down syndrome, has been left behind in his native Tanzania while his family grows new roots in Canada. Nishila Jaffer is Shanawaz's cousin. Anne Malloy, a lawyer with the Advocacy Resource Centre for the Handicapped, Arch, is representing the Jaffer family in an appeal hearing. And the, the really uh, horrible result of it is that whereas 90% of a family might be admissible to Canada, the one person with the disability will hold the whole family back. So that the family must either decide they do not come here at all, or they come without their disabled child or disabled sibling. You're acting on behalf of a Tanzanian family that had to leave one of their family members behind because that family member has Down syndrome. What's uh, the status of this case? The, the parents and their other two children came to Canada a year or two ago uh, and left Shanawaz at his choice to stay with his uncle in Tanzania. Uh, they were extremely close and he had grown up basically uh, with the two families being quite close. They owned a restaurant and ran a restaurant together in Dodomo, which is the city he lives in in Tanzania. And he stayed quite happily there for um, about a year or so when the uncle also decided to emigrate to Canada. This is a very large extended family. It has something like 10 brothers and sisters at the parents' level. And he, by himself, is now in Tanzania staying with a family friend. Does your cousin, Shanawaz, want to come to Canada? Oh, yes, he really wants to come to join his family. What would he do if he came to Canada? Oh, if he comes here, he will help my uncle in, uh, my uncle owns a business, a coffee shop. So he'll help my uncle in that, that coffee shop. I should, just so we understand what we're talking about, Shanawaz does have a mental disability. He has um, Down syndrome. Notwithstanding that, it is not an extremely severe case. He uh, is able to dress himself. He cooks for himself. He goes around the town on his own, finds his way to where he wants to go. He has his own friends, his own social life. And he works in the family restaurant, or at least he did when they were running the restaurant. <clears throat> the only diagnosis from the uh, doctor who did the assessment in Tanzania is mental retardation with mutism. For some reason, this doctor leaped to the conclusion that Shanawaz could not speak. In fact, he speaks two languages. He speaks Gujarati, which is the family dialect, uh, an East Indian dialect, and Swahili, which is the native tongue in Tanzania. But this particular doctor um, is English. Uh, Nashila was, in fact, with him when he had the medical exam. Um, the doctor conducted the whole thing in English, and because Shauna was didn't talk back to him, came to the conclusion that he was mute. <laughs> that's that's part of the diagnosis is that he can't talk. Now, <clears throat> the other thing I should tell you is that this is not particularly unusual. Uh, I mean, the mixed diagnosis is unusual, but refusing somebody admission to Canada simply because they are what is called mentally retarded is not at all unusual. In fact, it's a fairly standard practice. The Jaffer family's appeal will be heard next February. These appeals, when granted, are usually on humanitarian grounds. Families applying from outside the country are in an even worse position than the Jaffers. They have no right to appeal. The only ones with that right are refugees and disabled people with family members in Canada who are sponsoring their applications. Barbara McDougall, the minister responsible for immigration, told DNET she is not able to comment on individual cases, but says she has hopes that the act will change. Well, we certainly are reviewing the policy. It is in uh, the Immigration Act, but it hasn't been really looked at since 1976. And uh, at my request uh, earlier this year, the end of last year, I asked for a, a review of the whole medical inadmissibility st uh, section. It is going to be a fairly comprehensive review. What kinds of changes do you predict uh, could happen to that? We're looking at the whole definition of inadmissibility. Uh, we're looking at the definition of excessive demand on the health care system, all those enormously insensitive phrases that uh, lawyers put into legislation. 
And uh, my own view is that I would like to see um, uh, some fairly profound changes in this section, but until I get the review, it's very difficult for me to be precise. For, for families appealing cases here in Canada, what can they expect in getting a disabled member into Canada? There's a broad range of, of um, uh, illnesses, disabilities, that, and we try and take individual circumstances into account. And uh, uh, the appeal board, I think, is sensitive to that. Uh, certainly, I, I would encourage them to be to the extent that I have an influence on them. They are, of course, uh, an independent body. But my own view is that they should be very sensitive to these issues. But we do have to, we have to find the right balance between um, uh, the needs of families who want to come to Canada that may have disabled members, and also uh, the health care system that, that we have. And uh, my own view, and the reason I asked for the review, is that I don't think we have that balance right, but we will always have to take those two things into account. One final point, Susan. National disability organizations claim that the act is in fact unconstitutional, a claim that will no doubt be a key factor in future court challenges. We'll keep you posted on further developments. All citizens in this country are expected to perform jury duty when called upon. It's the law, but not everyone is equal under that law. Jack Austin, who was deaf, was ordered to perform jury duty. But when he said he was deaf, he was turned down. Some of us would have breathed a sigh of relief, but not Austin. He saw himself as a victim of discrimination. He took his case to the Advocacy Resource Center for the Handicapped, ARCH. Austin spoke to me through interpreter Lorna Schuster. He feels strongly about the way he was treated by the court officials. They called back saying, well, that's not, I mean, that's impossible, you're deaf. So I asked the question, of course, uh, as to discrimination, and they said, well, we have nothing here. We don't know what to do to deal with this. So I, as I say, that's how I got in touch with ARCH, the Advocacy Resource Center, to see if um, they could become involved and make some contact for me. And uh, apparently when they contacted, the story was a little different. So some re research was done, and uh, the proof was found, and they didn't, they didn't have any choice. So uh, the process was started. They didn't try to stop it, and I continued, continued along in the jury process. It's my understanding that uh, under the Charter of Rights, you have the right to interpretive services. Why didn't the people of the province know that you had that right? I think probably it was just that in reading through the Charter of Rights, uh, well, I'm, we're talking three years ago, it was something that occurred to me, and I kept it in mind. And so, I don't know, when this process started happening, I don't know if people just don't bother reading the Charter of Rights or they don't think about what it really means because they're too busy. And so the situation just came up and nobody seemed to, be, seemed to know what to do. And it, it was the same with the judge. Now, you haven't as yet been on a jury, but you've gone through the whole selection process. What's been the reaction from the people at the courts to a deaf juror? I think people were mostly really interested. I think that a lot of them uh, spent some time encouraging me. They were pretty impressed with what a deaf person might be able to do. I mean, certainly there are deaf people who don't, you know, are limited or have trouble with English that wouldn't, I mean, I'm not saying all deaf people could be on a jury. It's an individual thing. So these, these people started realizing, you know, they thought that that was kind of a neat thing as the only deaf person, it was all new to them, and they were pretty encouraging, actually. A lot of them would ask me how it would work or how they could learn sign language, how sign language worked. So there was a chance for some awareness. They seemed to, you know, realize that they're, you know, as French and Russian and English are all languages and they use interpreters, that there was really no difference about using a sign language interpreter, that it was just to make communication happen because we can't hear. Mr. Austin, most people when they're asked to be in a jury come up with all sorts of excuses why they can't be in a jury. Why do you want to be in a jury?
I think probably the reason was that I wanted to uh, challenge that so that deaf people could be more like hearing people. Uh, typically we are kind of thought of as uh, not quite as smart as hearing people and in my mind I wanted people to see that we really are the same. Um, that our eyes are our ears. The only difference with us is that we need an interpreter to help us understand what's going on. Nick Pantaluck has been a small engine technician with the City of Toronto's Purchasing and Supply Equipment Division for 10 years. Blind since birth, he has always had a good feel for fixing things. When I was in school, like, I always took things apart. I was always curious. And I figured small engine was my thing. Uh, I figured that it seemed to be an interesting thing. It was a rewarding thing to take things apart and put them together and make sure the thing ran properly. Sometimes I'm a little bit more slow at doing things, I will admit that, but uh, when the job is done, it's done. It, it, it won't come back, usually. Well, all my wrenches and pliers and whatever, you know, impact tools, uh, all that stuff I bought on my own. I make up my braille micrometers. I got a, a compression tester for testing compression in the, uh, in the cylinder. I got that uh, made up specially for me. One of the guys did it for me here. I found one that I could take the face off, the glass off, and then mark it internally just like a braille watch. The, he can tear a piece of machinery apart, sometimes at least for three, four, six weeks. And he gets the parts in, he puts it all together. There were some people that uh, were very pessimistic, per se, were, were rather doubtful, I guess. And then, then there were some op optimistic individuals who really looked at it on the, on the, on the, on the side and said, well, well, when you get down to it, they were, the, their opinion was, you know, like, in some cases you can't see what you're doing anyhow. You have to put your hands in areas where, where it's impossible. You're going by feel. Or you have to go by sound. And that's basically what I'm going, is by, by, by feel and by sound. And so a lot of that, that made general, uh, you know, made sense to them. But there was, there, was some, there was some resistance to it. For somebody who never seen it, it's unbelievable. So it's said every day I'm amazed when I watch him sometimes, uh, you know, when you're just doing things. He doesn't even realize somebody's watching. It's just said I'm, I'm amazed. It's fantastic. My specialty is small engines and, and equipment, and uh, they'll come and ask me a question, and if they have a problem setting a machine up, they'll ask me if I can give them a hand, and so we, we, we help each other. If I cannot do something and someone tells me I can't do something and if there is something I know I can't do, I try to figure a way that I can do it so that uh, it makes life a lot easier for me. You met Nick and I think you'd agree that half of his secret to success equation is the uh, relationship he's developed with others. Well, it's really neat to see him, uh, you know, helping other people when they help him. So there's a real good uh, camaraderie at the, in the shop. That's right. We'd like to hear your comments on the show or any stories you might have to share. Our address is the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. Or fax us at area code 416-975-5636. I'm Susan Pettit. And I'm Joe Coughlin. See you again next week.